Today, let's talk about every developer or operator or administrator's favorite tool, SSH. Um, <clears throat> if you're a security person, SSH might not be your favorite tool. You kind of have a bit more appreciation for some of the risks and, and dangers that are enabled by such a powerful tool. Uh, my name is Russell Lewis, and I'm on the product and application security team at Netflix. And our team's charter is really to build security services and tools that are then used by the broader engineering infrastructure and teams at Netflix. So we have to ride both sides of the fence and can look at, uh, really look at SSH from both a security perspective as well as somebody who runs and maintains production systems. So for those of you who don't have a security background, I wanna share a little story about an example of why SSH is great, but also a little uh, frightening at times. A startup that dealt with cryptocurrency exchange called Shapeshift uh, not too long ago um, had a really nice post about uh, a very serious matter they encountered. They had actually um, been hacked three times in a month and were very open and transparent with the community about what had happened and how they had recovered. But kind of the summary of that really was, it started with a malicious insider, which is the worst kind of threat you can have, uh, especially with someone with SSH access. And this guy was their system administrator. He set up all of their servers, so he knew how to get everywhere. And uh, you know, one day, the, this guy decided to steal bitcoins from this company and, and run off with them. And uh, so you know, to kind of recover from that incident, Shapeshift did what anybody would do and kind of evaluate their infrastructure and say, we can't trust any of this. Anything this guy touched could be tainted. Um, so they went through a very rigorous effort, changed all their SSH keys. They deployed their entire infrastructure and a whole new cloud hosting provider. They rebuilt all of their servers and got everything up and running uh, to kind of scrub any sort of possible backdoor that this insider had, had left behind. However, right as they were getting ready to flip this switch to, to send production traffic back through their exchange, they were hacked again and had more cryptocurrencies taken out of their wallets running on their servers. This time the attacker seemed a little more sophisticated and actually had bothered to wipe the access logs um, related to which instances he was getting on and, and how uh, that person had authenticated. So the Shapeshift employees were really left kind of clueless as to you know, what was that means that this hacker had gotten onto their infrastructure, especially considering it was all new. Uh, they were hacked once again by this same uh, in intruder after setting up yet another set of infrastructure. And after that, they kind of called in some from forensics experts to really evaluate what's going on here. We need to get our, our company up and running again. We can't handle all this downtime and keep being hacked. And uh, the forensics experts and, and, and actually kind of communication with the, the, the hacker itself, the, the the, the entity that was Shapeshift, the, the employees kind of figured out it was really just one rogue SSH key that was the enabler of their downfall. And that's, that key was stolen through a backdoor that that initial insider had installed on a laptop. So he had put remote desktop uh, on, on someone else's laptop and that enabled the theft of a new SSH key. So, you know, incidents like that happen, and they're serious, and they can be, you know, game ending for companies. Shapeshift, thankfully, is still around, but you, as you can imagine, uh, within your own companies, that could be a little bit of a, um, a, a tough situation. So, is it possible to build an infrastructure that enables SSH, um, but, but makes incidents like this at least harder to occur, or maybe prevent some of the methods used and offer a little bit more safety? A very traditional solution to this would be to say, like, let's have very strong, thorough SSH key management. And if we have a good understanding and we have good practices in place and all this process and, and, and whatnot, we can protect ourselves. But uh, if you look at this NIST report that I'm kind of citing here, they've got a really interesting finding about SSH across the industry as a whole. And one of the key takeaways is many organizations don't even know how many SSH keys they have configured on which servers and who's got copies of those keys or access to those keys. So it kind of just emphasizes the point that private keys can get lost, they can get stolen, uh, they can get shared, or they can be posted on GitHub. Um, 
replacing keys when that happens is never, uh, you know, it's never a good exercise because most people don't have it in their run books or not practicing it all of the time. Uh, but you, your, your hand is forced and you have to replace it. So the way you do that, right, is you update your authorized key file on all of your servers that, that key was on. How do you know where those are? Because if you are a normal company, you don't have that strong audit trail. But even if you knew what servers to update, how uh, do you have the confidence that you've actually hit every, uh, every single server? And, and not only when you hit the servers, have you removed like all of the other keys that may or may not have belonged there? And that all really can only be done if you have that strong understanding of which keys belong to which devices and who is using them and for what purpose. And lastly, the real kind of rub in all of this is, how are you going to actually update all of your server's authorized key files with this new configuration to remove these old keys? Are you gonna use SSH itself to do that? Uh, what if that's the key that just got stolen? Uh, so as you can kind of understand, SSH key management is important, but it's difficult to get right, and there's a lot of complexity to it, and as a whole, the industry isn't really doing it effectively. So it's a tough problem to solve. Are there ways that we can solve maybe other problems uh, in, in the same space to make this whole thing less dangerous? What if we had a system where you only could use an SSH key once? You use it, you lose it, you don't care about it after that. Would that help in this scenario? What if you had a system that left a really strong audit trail for every action that was taken from multiple places in the, in the ecosystem and then centrally collected it? So you could have somebody who doesn't need to be an amazing detective figure out what just happened to your infrastructure. And lastly, how do we protect access to our servers? There's a couple of things to protect, right? The first would be network security. How do you restrict network access to those servers in a way that you're confident that only uh, people on the list are allowed in? Uh, and that re relies on not only network access controls, but also strong authentication. Is, is anybody doing this? Are there systems that we can go use right now that, that give us all of these properties and help simplify SSH key management? And before I can answer that, we have to kind of look back at will it work for Netflix and some of the challenges that may be uh, not shared across everybody, but certainly are very sensitive to Netflix. So let's talk a, just a bit about Netflix culture. It's really, really founded on these freedom and responsibility pillars. And there's a number of other key tenets to that culture. But if you were to boil it all down, it really is a, a number of philosophies to help answer the question, how can we work like a startup but manage all of the responsibilities of a big company. And, and some of the, like the, the little interesting tidbits out of our culture really revolve around, and, and this is difficult for security-minded people sometimes, sharing of information openly and proactively. This is all about transparency. And so anything you're doing, you should be able to disclose to other people that you work with. And the reasoning behind this is Netflix is about sharing context around what you're doing and why you're doing things as opposed to controlling how you do things. Um, another really key aspect of our culture is if you build it, you run it. So we have a lot of teams, we have a lot of developers, we have a lot of services. We have more services than teams or developers, but those engineers on those teams are responsible for operating all of the services that their team runs. So that means I have a lot of people who have to get on to their services when something is going wrong or as they're developing or debugging. And so that means everybody basically who's an engineer at the company needs SSH. So that's terrifying, it should be, I hope. Um, so how do we keep things secure in a world where basically all of the engineers, and there's lots and lots and lots of them, need uh, a tool as powerful and as dangerous as SSH? Generally, our security team tries to solve security problems um, with a, a feature-driven approach as opposed to adding friction in places. Um, part of the way we do that is we, we try to uh, practice defining good secure defaults across various tooling and just including that out of the box for, for teams to then run with and adapting it on maybe the corner cases, but generally great secure defaults and then catch kind of any changes to that configuration by building tools that allow us to have automated scanning in place. So, you know, we're checking network access policies, we're, we're checking, you know, Amazon permissions, we're checking, uh, you know, secrets in source code, always scanning for people who are kind of stepping outside of the, the ecosystem we expect them to, the sandbox we expect them to play in. 
And to help with that, we also provide um, some kind of centralized secret management tools so teams can focus more on building applications and using a service to manage secrets as opposed to having to try to protect every little bottom secret in their ecosystem themselves. Um, I think it, it helps a lot to have one team focused on that problem and then sharing that knowledge outwards. And then lastly, we kind of button everything up we do on the security team with lots of alerting for anything that looks uh, you know, out of bounds and lots of reports to kind of convince ourselves that the ecosystem is behaving. So if we take that, that cultural viewpoint of I have lots of people and, and our you know, security team is, is kind of got these normal tools we, we use, how do we apply that to solving the SSH problem and protecting that? Well, first, let's kind of quickly talk about some, some industry practices related to SSH. Uh, the first one is, of course, back to that key protection problem. Uh, I don't know about you, but I certainly have run into a lot of people who have an SSH key that has no password on it. So if I have access to your machine, I can copy the file and impersonate you. I can authenticate to any server you can with no password. Okay, let's say maybe you're a little bit more diligent and you have a nice strong password on your SSH key. How many people have added it to their OS keychain so they don't have to type that long, awesome, strong password in all the time when they log into the servers? That also has problems, right? If your workstation is unlocked, somebody can authenticate as you. If you log into a server that has been compromised and you're using SSH agent, they can issue requests against your private key and then masquerade as you. So <clears throat> keeping private keys private can be a, a bit of a challenge. There are companies out there that have a number of hardware solutions to help you keep those private keys private. And you know, they themselves have their own little corner cases. You have to hand out dongles to every single person or devices to every single person who needs access. And that's not so bad when you have a handful of operators, but when you have you know, hundreds and hundreds of operators, um, it's a bit more of a, a overhead that we don't really want to incur if we can avoid it. And there's usually you know, varying degrees of, of kind of smoothness associated with the systems or, or cost uh, as, a, as a deterrent. So, you know, let's say you've got the best in practice uh, you know, for, for managing your private keys and keeping them safe. Maybe you're in hardware, maybe you're just always typing in a really strong password. As a server, how do I verify that you're doing what I need you to do to keep your private keys safe? There's nothing really out of the box that a server could do to say, hey, you need to have a strong password and rotate it. You have to build your own custom tooling that runs on hosts or there's a couple other ways. But as a server, just accepting a blind SSH connection, it can't guarantee you've protected your key the whole time. Another dimension to kind of look at is just the networking access model onto servers. So a traditional kind of approach is you've maybe got a protected network, maybe it's behind a VPN or maybe it's just you know, on-premise, um, but once you're on that network, if you've got uh, you know, <clears throat> the right operator keys on your device, then you can get onto the server or servers that you, you should. Sometimes it's one operator who can hit everything, sometimes it's a couple of guys who can hit everything, or maybe you've got some authorization kind of defined and you're managing public keys on which servers. But you still have all of the same problems with public key management, uh, SSH public key management in this kind of world. There's another variant, and, and, and we'll dig a, a bit more on this later, but it's a bastion-based variant. And you can still have VPN you know, wrapping all of this around or strong network uh, controls wrapping around access to the bastion itself. But the idea is, instead of connecting directly to your server, you have to go through an intermediary. And that intermediary uh, can give us a lot of nice little security properties. So what's the Netflix approach? We kind of looked at the industry and kind of said, what, you know, what are people doing? How did we solve this problem for us? Again, our, to recap, our system objective is really to ask ourselves, how can we give developers ac access to the services they need when they need them without imposing a barrier? So asking for approval, making requests, that's not really gonna work for us. We need that freedom. And part of the way we do that is, while we're doing that, we wanna be able to gather context around what the developer is needing that access for without imposing too much friction associated with that uh, context gathering. And then lastly, it will kind of safeguard ourselves by having automated scanning of all of the undesirable SSH usage so that we can kind of convince ourselves that it's not being abused. So again, that first, uh, first central point of, of security really ties into the bastions. And they add a lot of nice properties. It's a choke point for network connectivity, right? If you shut off SSH access to all of your servers, except for requests coming from a bastion, then you can easier you have an easier time detecting kind of erroneous network activity and uh, you know if somebody is changing a, a network firewall configuration we have tools in place that help us find those but you know, it's a lot easier to find hey, every SSH traffic request should come from this one IP address or several IP addresses 
Bastions are also uh, convenient because it helps simplify that strong authentication we really want to have for, of our employees. You know, I only have one set of servers to manage LDAP configuration for to, to tie into SSO. So we only have one place to manage authentication and authorization policies for all of our employees. And that, you know, SSO is something that we need for other corporate tools. So tying it into the Bastion is really, uh, takes away an operational burden and it simplifies our server deployment because it's only one machine or one fleet of machines that needs to be configured with that LDAP configuration. Also, Bastions can act as a really great place to log all activity. If you're not jumping through them, but you're jumping onto them and then jumping onto another box, I have an opportunity to log everything you're typing on a shell. And we can capture that and, and send it off box and, and preserve that for auditing purposes, as well as just kind of information gathering purposes. So that's really convenient. And also because a Bastion doesn't run anything real, developers don't need privileged access on it for any reason. And so again, we can lock down all the various config files and log files on that server, um, and, and you know, developers won't have access to manipulate the running machine they're on. They have to go into another, another machine to do what they wanted to do. <coughs> The nice thing that we have with Bastions as well is all of our Bastions have a shared home drive, and that uh, is kind of how we enable users to just self-manage their public keys on SSH. So they can control their own key access and no one else's, and if they lose their key or need to upgrade the key, they lost their laptop or whatever, they can rotate the key in one place themselves. And we have a catch-all we can talk about in a second uh, that makes that slightly less scary. And the last, I think, great property about a Bastion is it's one system for us to manage the server access tools. So you've got one place to kind of double check all the security configurations. You've got one place to manage the updates of our cloud tooling as opposed to distributing that cloud tooling onto every developer's laptop. Um, you know, we have to essentially figure out when a developer wants to get onto one application, which instance is that? What's the IP address for the instance? What's the username that is allowed to log in via SSH on that instance? Um, we can put all that tooling in one place for developers as opposed to having to try to distribute all those upgrades and coordinate people uh, during outages and, and things like that. So we talked about uh, public key management and kind of letting users self-manage. And it doesn't solve the SSH key management problem, but I think it really does simplify it is if you can use two-factor authentication. Right? And that's really about verifying the intended use at that point in time. And so if I am managing my own private key and public key relationship with the Bastion and I compromise my private key somehow, I'm gonna get a push notification to a device and say, oh, hey, like, I didn't make that request. What's going on here? I can alert the right people and, and we can go figure out where that request came from. Or if somebody's added a, an, an extra public key under my authorized key file, because as users, you're not gonna be auditing those all of the time. Again, you'll get the second factor and it'll raise an eyebrow, hopefully. Um, for us, second factor, again, is already something that is provisioned in our ecosystem with SSO, so it's very easy to add on. It's not another thing to provision, another separate device to, to maintain. It's just something you have to do already for various other tools. And turning on second factor for your own services is actually really easy. Pretty much any two-factor solution out there has a PAM module, so you can just kind of load it up on these simple boxes, configure it, and that's the one thing is you have to go get that pairing between a user and, and their second factor, but if you're, if you're already doing that, it's, it's kind of a really easy win, and if you're not, it can be fairly simple to set up. Um, we also like it because it discourages um, automated workflows that use SSH that we don't really desire. If a developer has kind of a cron job running somewhere that then needs to hit hop onto an instance via SSH and manipulate some stuff, that's not really a best practice for us. So having that second factor is a bit of a deterrent and we can encourage them to use the right tools or stronger tools that are better, more purpose built. And um, you know, if, if, if one of the questions that we would get a lot when we were kind of playing with this is, hey, what if I need to open up multiple SSH sessions all through the bastion to a number of different servers while I'm troubleshooting an issue. I don't want to have to keep doing a you know, second factor request after second factor request. Uh, SSH multiplexing is supported right out of the box. It's really easy to configure and you can just reuse that one authentication session and just add more uh, individual SSH terminals on top of that. So it's a really good way to, to mitigate the over second factor problem. Another really key point to securing SSH in your infrastructure is having a, uh, a, a really good and well-maintained SSH daemon config. For us, we configure that as a part of a base Linux distribution that engineering teams just build their application on top of, and so every time they redeploy a new app, they get the latest OS security updates. We include in that kind of the default recommendation that has good security practices. <coughs> 
SSH config. So out of the box, teams don't have to worry about setting up SSH for their use case, it just works. Um, and uh, we already have, for other reasons, uh, tooling in place to track which teams are running which of these Linux distribution images and, uh, and what configuration state they're at. Because you know, if an open SSL vulnerability happens, um, you need to accelerate sometimes the upgrade path. So we, we, it's good to have tools to track that, and that's how we just added the SSH configs into, as a part of that. So let's revisit um, SSH single-use keys. It's really exciting to have those single-purpose keys. And a few years ago, um, SSH certificates came out, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of uh, adoption within the industry right now. And, and for us, we uh, at Netflix really like certificates and, and shorter-lived and shorter certificates. So we uh, built a tool uh, called Bless that allows us to have these single-serving SSH certificates. So if you're not familiar with SSH certificates, uh, let me explain to you why you should love them, because they are great. Um, there's a, two types of certificates. There's user certificates, which is really what we're talking about here when a user logs into a remote service. Uh, but there's also host certificates, which can be interesting if you've ever um, blindly hit yes on trusting a server. Uh, host certificates allow you to trust a CA once, and then all servers that have certificates under that CA, you don't have to hope the fingerprint is right or just keep deleting lines out of your known host file. Instead, you can just keep the certificate authority uh, you know, and, and trust that it keeps your servers valid. But for this, we're talking about user certificates, and they have a bunch of really interesting properties. Uh, the first one I want to point out here is the key ID. It's a, it's a field for just describing whatever you want, and this field gets logged anytime that certificate is used for authentication. So if you put something interesting in that field, it will show up in an interesting place in it, by SSH daemon logging it to authlog or, or wherever else your SSH access logs go. And again, you know, Netflix loves short-lived certificates, and you can do that with SSH certificates as well. You can set time validity ranges. And, and so you really only need, uh, because the certificate is only used at authentication and not maintaining the session, you only need a validity window long enough to go get a certificate and then use it, and then after that, you don't care if it's valid because the session will, will stay established even after the certificate has expired. So you can have short certs and long sessions. Uh, another great tool of SSH certificates that allow you to restrict how an SSH connection is used is this principles field. And in it, you can specify, normally you would say just like the username of the server you're gonna log in as, but you can specify custom things in here that better articulate what the concept of single use in your ecosystem would be. So you could maybe expand upon the username and say, let's have something to do with the account or the application as well as the username, maybe even some sort of server or instance identifier. Whatever meets your kind of team's needs, you can, you can define what that will be in the principles field when you issue the certificate, and you can enforce it when you verify it on the client side by specifying which valid principles are, are allowed in. And again, another nice security control uh, is you can say this certificate is only good from one source. So for us, that's a Bastion IP, and we could say only requests coming from a Bastion can be used, uh, and so that's a nice little property. These last couple of properties are, are really good, especially if you use any sort of daemonless DevOps automation tools. Um, those daemonless tools, of course, really just use SSHD. And how do you know that one tool that has probably access to all of your servers isn't uh, acting up? These fields can at least help you restrict what uh, it's doing to what you told it to do. Uh, so you can force which commands can be run, and you can disable uh, things like port forwarding and agent forwarding that you wouldn't necessarily want in a, in a daemon application like that. So of course, to issue certificates, you need a certificate authority. And kind of the way you roll that out is you define which CAs you want to trust in your SSHD config. Um, we certainly would recommend you deploy multiple trusted CAs, and you keep them offline um, so that you can have the ability to rotate regularly and smoothly, but at the same time, if you ever do encounter a problem, you, know, you can react quickly by just moving to, you know, pulling off, uh, and pulling an offline CA out of the safe or wherever, bringing it up line, and, and just watching for anyone using the old uh, emergency moved off of CA. And it, it's nice to have the uh, ability to react to those kinds of things quickly. 
So again, we mentioned you know, like our tool to do this, our certificate authority is called Bless, and all it takes to really turn it on is one line in SSHD config, and then the public keys you want to trust. It's really that easy. If you want to do the principles, it's a little bit more configuration, but it's really simple. Oh, so, okay, it's great. We've got single-use certificates, we've got strong network access, we're authenticating everybody, but how do I know that I don't have somebody doing something that will scare me and keep me up at night? <clears throat> well, let's, let's see, how, how can we define, uh, how do we define undesirable SSH usage? For us, I would really categorize it as something that is malicious, it's, I think pretty, pretty obvious, something that is dangerous, where developers are like, well, I really needed it in the heat of the moment because something was breaking. Maybe there's a better way to do it, uh, but certainly it's a, it's a period where they're using a tool that could cause harm if it was abused. And then lastly, we kind of um, consider avoidable uses of SSH as undesirable. If we have better tooling that exists, um, we, we should use that. So if we're gonna go search for this uh, undesirable SSH uh, usage with as many developers as, as Netflix has and with many ser as many servers as we have, it really is a bit of a needle in a haystack problem. And maybe it's a bit larger than a haystack. Um, so, so how do we find these needles, these undesirable uh, uses of SSH? The Mythbusters had a really good um, episode that, that kind of always uh, in, you know, amused me, which is they put the test, the myth, like how hard is it to find a needle in a haystack? And they came up with some interesting solutions. Before we compare those, let's, let's kind of like look at this, the shape shift approach of finding a needle in a haystack. They basically discarded all of the hay and bought more hay. Um, they had to, they had to act fast. Uh, they didn't have tooling in place to, to do the kind of scanning you would need to do to find the needles, uh, and so they just tore down everything and rebuilt it. Now the Mythbusters approach, the Jamie approach, um, it was a bit more heavy-handed, and his was to just burn it down. So his idea was, let's take the hay, burn it all down, and then we'll just search through the ashes and find the needles. And that's pretty simple in theory. It doesn't take a lot of tools. You could get it done. Uh, but it was pretty destructive, and uh, if you were to apply that metaphor to the SSH world, that's kind of like saying, you don't get SSH, it's too dangerous, we're just gonna take it away. And then any sort of access we see with SSH, well that would be bad access, because you're not supposed to do it. Um, either approach, or this approach still has the searching problem. You still have to go find the needles in the ash, or you still have to go find the SSH accesses to your various servers that you're not expecting to be there. So Adam Savage's approach was a bit more Netflix in, in mind, I think, and, and his was really asking the question, can we sort the good from the bad? He ended up building a machine to exploit the different properties between needle and hay. It wasn't overly complex, and, uh, and basically, you know, he used water and, and exploited the density. So needles were sinking, hay was kind of floating, and he just kind of pipelined it through and, and was able to differentiate good and, and bad. And you know, as far as machinery goes, hopefully, you know, like certainly Netflix has its own data pipeline, but there's a lot of tools out there that allow teams to have strong data pipelines, and, and that's kind of the machinery you would need in, in place for this. So with respect to SSH, obviously we're not needles and, and hay, but what properties can we exploit to differentiate those undesirable accesses from the allowable ones? And to really answer that question, you have to look at how your engineers are using SSH in your own ecosystem. And, and to do that, if you have SSH certificates and, and you have you know, essentially an audit trail of those requests, you should be processing it and you can go look at how are they intended to be used. Uh, but there's a couple other things to check. You also need to check the SSH authentication attempts against your services. If everyone should be using certificates, every authentication should come with a certificate and anything else is a foul. And, um, and also you know, process those SSH session logs, right? So if you have a bastion, you can capture all that interactive terminal commands and be scanning for things that aren't desirable, but also be scanning to understand why are your developers using SSH as opposed to some other tools. And then from there, you can build reports and alerting. So how do we actually issue these SSH certificates? So we built a tool, it's called Bless. And, um, and what is Bless? It's a Python AWS Lambda function, and it constructs SSH certificates, and then it signs those certificates using um, the, the Python library cryptography. There wasn't a SSH certificate tool in Python, um, which is uh, one of the languages that runs in Lambda, so we had to actually build that. So why did we choose Lambda? And, and you know, if you haven't played with AWS Lambda, it's a really interesting um, like kind of, um, purpose-built tool. Um, 
But one of the advantages that really spoke to us was by using only Amazon services, we have no circular dependencies on Netflix infrastructure. <clears throat> so in the event of some sort of major kind of incident, we don't have to worry about, well, may that key component that I depended on had to have been up for me to get SSH on the box and now it's down and I can't get on. By having no dependencies on the Netflix infrastructure, we can always make sure that we can get SSH uh, when we need it. It's also really easy to be, because we have no dependencies on our own tools and our own infrastructure, it's really easy to just run this thing in a separate account where we can lock down the security controls to the, the most extreme extent. And you know, everybody who's on that list has to have a second factor and, and kind of the best security practices in place. And you can just kind of keep it out of the way. Separate accounts are also interesting because separate accounts means separate rate limits. And so uh, you can kind of help mitigate, uh, like if you have one system in production that's overusing a, an API that Amazon and this would depend on, be being, by being in a separate account, you're not gonna stomp on yourself when you really need it. Um, also, by running in Lambda, it's really easy to bootstrap the system automatically as opposed to maybe needing a human or having secrets not well protected. We can use KMS, which is Amazon's key management system to just unwrap that private key when we need to use it. And Lambda also helps us address the authentication of the SSH request problem. If we're asserting that requests should only come from a bastion to an instance, well, bastions are running in the cloud. They have instance credentials, and the Lambda function can enforce IAM rules and essentially only accept requests from the you know, services that have the right keys, and the bastion would be the only service that has the right key to even call the function in the first place. Um, also, Lambdas are nice because they have a nice story around audibility. By being in a separate account, we can control who can redeploy the code, change the code. We can control who has access to those logs that are essentially the record of the certificate authority. So how does, how does Bless work? How do we actually use it? Um, so Bastion starts off, again, it uses on instance credentials. That's the only thing the Bastion really has to worry about protecting. And you can do that with IP tables and essentially no one's running as privileged users. They can't access the on instance metadata endpoint to get those credentials except for this tooling. This tooling can then uh, use those credentials, figure out the IP address of the Amazon machine we actually want when I say, hey, get on this application and then issue a request over to Lambda. Lambda will authenticate it with those credentials and then call our code. So again, you know, the bootstrapping problem here, we use KMS, so at rest, there is no you know, plain text secret laying around in the config files, it's all encrypted data that can only be accessed with a key that can only be used in a one-off account. And so our code will then ask KMS every time it's called to decrypt what it needs to get at the private key to then do the remaining operations. At that point, our function will generate a certificate and that, this is where we can kind of insert our own policy, saying like, what are the right restrictions? I need the source IP address to be there. I need to have more information about the user's context. I need to have the right principles in place to make this really single use. And I can, you know, the Lambda function can enforce and controls like the certificate validity time. So it would set all that up, it signs the certificate, and then it logs that activity, right? For audibility, it takes all of the context with, associated with that request, if it passed or failed, and can shove it in CloudWatch logs where you can really restrict access to who can read those logs later and manipulate those logs. And then lastly, it gives us a normal SSH certificate back to the Bastion. The Bastions can then take that certificate and present it when they request uh, SSH to the instance. Now this is neat because in none of this am I really caring about what key the Bastion is using. I only care about the certificate. So the Bastion can use any key it really wants. It can use ephemeral private keys. Um, and and you know, when it signs or issues a certificate request, it just says here's the public key for the key I'm about to use. And then it can throw the key away as well as the certificate. And then once you do log on to the instance, SSHD on that instance will validate all of the properties in that certificate. Did it come from the right host? Is the time correct, et cetera? And then it logs uh, a nice chunk of data in its auth log about that request. And here's a great example of what that really looks like. In the past, if you just used public key auth on SSH, you got told like the time, you got you know, information about the IP address that it came in from. Well, for us, that would be a bastion, so it would always be the same IP, so it's not very exciting. You get information about the key that was used for that connection, which if you have great management, you know who that was. If you don't, uh, good luck. 
with the certificates, you get a lot more uh, control, again, over what you can present in that field, but you also get a little bit more information kind of out of the box for free. So we still know the request came from Bastion and what time it came in, but now we can know the request that was associated with the certificate issuance request. So we can go map the certificate use to the issuance in the audit log. That'll be a unique identifier, excuse me. Um, we also can specify who the certificate was for, not, not just from the Bastion, but who was the user who logged into the Bastion? What IP address were they on? Not just the Bastion's IP address. We could shove the, that information in the certificate and include things like the commands they were intending to run in that, in that field. So, hey, they were trying to get onto this application. Uh, we can just log that for free. And then we can tell information about the key they used as well as the certificate authority that was used to, to sign that certificate, and we can watch for when those um, aren't what we expect, right? If we're doing a rotation of certificate authorities, we can, should see a very clean cutover of, of certs being used. And again, we can control the validity, so we say certs should be valid, but it is nice to put in the information, like, no, really, it's only valid for a short amount of time. Nobody got a long-lived certificate that's maybe more broadly scoped. And then lastly, the instances themselves, you know, they, they log that in their authorization log, and, uh, and that can just, like I said, end up in CloudWatch logs. So we've built all this infrastructure. We, you know, embrace certificates. We love kind of a lot of the properties of the Bastion model, especially coupled with certificates and, and second factor. Looking back, would this have helped that terrifying shapeshift story, or at least made it more difficult for the, uh, the compromise to have been pulled off, right? And Malicious Insider is a very hard thing to protect against. Um, but by having second factor on the bastion, it, one of the, the people, like the guy whose SSH key was stolen, had his key used without his knowledge. And so if you have second factor and it is kind of enforced, it's the only way to get in, hopefully red flags will be raised when you get unusual and unexpected uh, second factor challenges. And also audit logs, having them like strongly collected and understanding them, having the tool already around to look at them and have them kind of locked away makes it, again, much, that much harder for somebody to get in and manipulate that data, especially when their audits are coming from three different places, right? The certificate authority, the bastion, and the servers themselves. And then embracing key rotations all the way down to the bottom, right? From day one, just kind of building in a system that says, you know what, it's not so scary to replace the, the bottom key in this whole infrastructure, and we're just gonna do it regularly to be ready for, for something. So with all that said, um, yeah, I hope that, you know, if nothing else, this has encouraged you to go look at and evaluate using SSH certificates in your own infrastructure. Um, we really do believe it is pretty easy to adopt. If you run in an Amazon ecosystem and, um, or, or want to and, uh, and have access to AWS Lambda, we also encourage you to check out Bless. It should now be on GitHub um, and open sourced under the Apache license. So please check it out. Uh, let us know what you think. And uh, I encourage you again to look at your own SSH infrastructure and ask how you can make it better without making it um, too process restrictive. Any questions? Sure. So the way we solve kind of the bootstrapping issue is you create a private key for the certificate authority, and then you, you protect the information to unlock that private key, the private key password. You can protect that with KMS, and when the Lambda function runs, only the, you can configure it so that only that Lambda function has access to use the key associated to decrypt the password to then unlock the private key and then issue certificates. So that's kind of how we deal with the bootstrapping problem is we just put it on Amazon's infrastructure and rely on Amazon to keep that secure, but. Are, are the ephemeral SSH certificates only at the second layer, or are they also at the Bastion post for the user's first, first pop? Sure, so uh, the, the question was, are, are we using those ephemeral things between the users and the Bastions, or the, or the Bastions and the instances? And right now we're only using it between the Bastions and the instances, um, and kind of the, Relying on the second factor between the users and the bastions is kind of our, our secondary measure there to make things more single-purposed. All right, well, I think we're at, right at time, but if there's any other questions, um, feel free to flag me down, so thank you.